Hello, it is so good to be here with you at Amazing Discoveries. My name is Cameron DeVazier and I'm a pastor in the Michigan Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. I pastor actually two, two church district, uh, Muskegon and Fremont on the west coast of Michigan. But I'm so happy to be here with you now as we're going to be looking at a series of messages entitled Lightning from Heaven. Let me introduce you to this thought. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, Jesus makes an interesting statement. He has sent out 70 to do work on his behalf, to do work of ministry, and they return with success. And they're overjoyed, and they say in verse 17 of Luke chapter 10, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, what did he mean by that? Typically, when we think of lightning, we think of quick as lightning or fast as lightning. So, immediacy, instantaneous. But obviously, Satan's fall has not been in an instant. It's taken quite a bit of time. In fact, thousands of years at this point, and Satan still exists. So, what did Christ mean? Well, handily enough, in just a few chapters later, in Luke chapter 17, Jesus used this analogy of lightning once more, but this time, instead of the fall of Satan, he speaks of his own return. Luke chapter 17, starting with verse 23, we read these words from Jesus again. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part of under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. So notice when Jesus used that analogy of lightning from heaven, lightning coming out of the sky, for his own return, he did not mean it would be instantaneous, it would be quick, it would be right now. In fact, he meant that it would come from east to west, it would shine across the whole world so that every eye, as Revelation 1 tells us, shall see him. I believe the same thing was intended when he talked about the fall of Satan, that every eye will see him, and that at the end of this great controversy between Christ and Satan, this cosmic battle, no one will have any questions remaining as to what the issues were at stake and which side won, for Satan will fall like lightning from heaven. We'll begin this series with a message entitled, An Enemy Has Done This, but before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the great privilege and humbling responsibility of presenting your word. So, Lord, I ask today that my words not be heard, but your word indeed would be clear. We ask the same Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of the Bible now to give us its understanding and by that same Holy Spirit to give us application so that we can have our part to play in ending this cosmic controversy and hastening the coming of Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is speaking with some individuals, and of course his disciples were there with him. And Matthew chapter 13 basically is just a, a collection of parables that Jesus tells. And we find one that apparently had a particular interest for his disciples. You can find it in Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How is it then that it has tares. How then does it have tares? They ask. Verse 28, he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And thus the parable ends, and in fact the text continues, another parable he put forth to them, and he just kept telling parables. But this particular parable must have struck a nerve with his disciples, for we read in verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. 
And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And Jesus gives them exactly what they asked for. He doesn't just repeat them, the symbols. He, in fact, interprets his own parable for his own disciples. And he says in verse 37, And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, verse 40, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the, sh in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, what I'd like to do is take exactly what Jesus did. And you notice he started with a parable that was all symbols. And, and when the people went away, the disciples said, explain to us what that means. And Jesus said, each item represents this particular thing. And he breaks down what he's saying. So I'd like to look at that more closely. First of all, he tells us what the field in the story is. He said, the field is the world. And it's the owner's field. He owns it. And of course, Jesus said that he was the son of man. He was the farmer. He was the sower. And friends, the field is the world. And the world in which we live is Jesus by ownership, by creative power. John chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then it tells us in verse 3, All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. This world is his by right. Colossians chapter 1 echoes the same thing. The Apostle Paul writes, verses 15 through 17, speaking of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. When Jesus says that the field is the world and that he is the sower, he means it in a very literal sense. He built, he created, he fashioned and formed this world and all that is in it. He indeed is the sower. He goes on to say, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, righteousness, goodness, those, those who do well. This is what was intended for this world. And that's what he was sowing in this, in the parable, he was sowing good seed and only good seed, exclusively good seed. Not a tear was in the bag. All the seed was good. And Jesus says, when I created this world, everything in it was good. In fact, the Bible records this very thing. If you go back to Genesis chapter one, it records each step of Christ's creative process. And again, it's Jesus Christ. It's not just God in a nebulative sense, nebula, nebulous sense. The Father is the administrator, and by his will, the Son executed his plan of creation. And day one, day two, day three unfolded under Jesus' care and by his power. And at the end of each day, he looked back over the things that he had made, and he declared each one to be, and he uses a certain word, good. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4, he looks at the light and he saw that it was good. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 10, the dry land and water he declares to be good. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 12, he looks at the vegetation and he says it is good. Chapter 1 verse 18, the sun, moon, and stars he says are good. Verse 21, the birds and the fish are good. Verse 25, the land animals are good. And finally, in verse 31, he creates humanity in the image of God, surveys all the work that he had done, and declares it is indeed very good. Jesus Christ is the sower, the field is the world, and everything that he put in it, he has declared to be good, indeed very good. Nothing wrong with this world in its original form. So the question comes back, then how then does a good man with a good field who sowed good seed produce tares? Where did the wickedness come from? If the world was full of righteousness, full of goodness, 
how is it possible if you're God, and this is your field and the work of your hands, that out comes tares or wickedness? Why is there evil in a good God's world? So we go back to Matthew chapter 13. Jesus continues with his explanation, saying that the reapers are the angels. In fact, let's read it directly. Matthew chapter 13, once again. Verse 38, we'll start, The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Verse 39, The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So he says there is a day coming, it's called the harvest, the end of the age, and the one responsible will pay for his deeds. The wickedness that you see, the evil that you see, the sin in this world is responsible back to one individual. He's the devil. Christ unequivocally says, I did not do it. An enemy has done this. How many times do people question the Lord when bad things happen? Lord, why did you do this? Yet, interestingly enough, when something good happens, we say, oh, how fortunate we are, how lucky we are. Christ looks at this situation, he says, I did not do it. He does not say, you know, you're right, I, I really should have built a fence, I really should have fixed it up, I, I should have done something differently. You know, I should have known it was coming and just evaded the whole... He doesn't equivocate, he doesn't, he doesn't obfuscate, he doesn't tiptoe around. He said, I didn't do it. An enemy has done this. Very clear. It's not my fault. Then he goes on to say, there will be a day when the world will be judged, when the end of the age will come, and notice it says, the reapers are the angels. The servants who work for him, tending and reaping, are the angels. Now, I want to highlight that point, because if we go back to the original parable, it, notice it says in verse 26, but when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And it says in verse 27, so the servants of the owner came and said to him. These are servants of the owners, those who work for him in his field. These are the harvesters. These are the reapers. These are the ones who are his servants. And they're asking him the questions. This is a pivotal point. Let's highlight this some more. Again, so the servants of the owner came and said to him, sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Think about this, friends. Is it possible that even the loyal servants of God, his angels, the unfallen beings in the heavenly realms, have questions for God about the presence and process of evil and its elimination. Is it possible that even they don't understand all that's involved in this great controversy? So the reapers are asking the question, the servants. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good and sued seed in your field? The implication is, if you're so good, how is this so bad? continues on. How then does it have tares? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? So as soon as Christ says, I did not take responsibility for this, it is not my fault, an enemy has done this, their immediate reaction is, ah, okay, now we believe you. Should we go eradicate the tares? Should we clean and purge the field, the world? And notice that Christ's answer is very, very important. He says here, but he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. This is of critical importance, brothers and sisters. It says here, the reason the sower, the farmer, the owner of the field allowed the tares to grow was not his lack of concern for the problem, nor was it his lack of ability to solve the problem. The reason the farmer allowed the tares to grow was his concern for the wheat. No, lest while you gather them up, you also uproot the wheat with them. Now expand the analogy, get the spiritual application, the interpretation of the parable. Somehow, Friends, and this is going to be a difficult thought, but we must wrestle with this. This is what the series is all about. Somehow, it is in the best interest of the righteous that wickedness be allowed to continue and mature 
until the harvest comes. Think about what we're saying here. In the parable of the tares in the field, Christ says, no, but for the good of the wheat, we have to allow the tares to mature, to develop, to be seen for what they are. There is a day coming. Notice again, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. God is not unconcerned about the existence of evil. In fact, his concern for it drives him to the process of elimination that he has planned. There is a day coming when justice will be executed and the field that is this world will be cleansed of all of its wickedness. But the reason that day has not come yet, according to Christ himself, is for his concern for the righteous. Now, we're going to expand on this as we continue with our series. But let's now go back to this issue. Notice that Christ sets up in this parable a war. He uses the word an enemy. Again, Christ is the creator. He sowed this good field, good, good, good things in it, nothing bad in his, in his realm at all. Yet he says there was an enemy. Notice he didn't say an enemy was planted here or that he made the enemy, but there was already an enemy who invaded his field and planted the tares. The implication of Matthew chapter 13's parable is that there was already an ongoing battle. The lines were drawn. There was Christ and there was an enemy in place who was ready to counteract all that Christ did in this field, this world. So now we're going to step back. We're going to peel back from Scripture this picture that Christ has painted in parable form, and we're going to see what the Bible tells us about this war behind the parable. We're going to start in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. There are honestly very few places in Scripture that tell us about Lucifer before the fall, this devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. What was going on before the enemy did this here? What caused or what was the background story, the context of his experience? It goes on to explain in chapter 28 of Ezekiel, verse 14. Speaking of Lucifer, which of course means light bearer, he says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now think about what this is saying. Here the Bible is giving the behind the scenes view of this enemy who has done this. And it begins talking about his perfection. Lucifer, the light bearer, has fallen from heaven. You, it says, or the anointed cherub who covers. If you're at all familiar with Scripture, you'll recognize that idea of a covering angel in the presence of God. Your mind goes back immediately to ancient Israel and the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. In there was the law of God and other things, Aaron's budded a rod and the, and the pot of manna inside of this Ark of the Covenant, all things that God had touched and blessed with his own hands. And on top of it was the seat of mercy. By the way, isn't it wonderful that God's throne is called the mercy seat and not the seat of damnation? It's not the judgment seat, it's the mercy seat. And on top of that mercy seat, in the most holy place of that sanctuary, dwelt the Shekinah glory, which was a symbol of the very presence of God. And on top of that seat, as well beside that Shekinah glory, were two angels with their heads bowed and their wings folded over who covered the mercy seat. And apparently the enemy of Christ used to be one of those covering cherubs. It says, for I anointed you, so I appointed you. Some versions even say, for so I ordained you. Apparently, the enemy of Christ, who he refers to in Matthew 13's parable, used to be not only a friend of Christ, but a servant of Christ. The high, exalted, covering cherub, an ordained minister in the courts of God, if you can wrap your minds around it. He was a pastor to the angels. He was a minister in the courts of God, and yet he's become the enemy who brought in the tares and the wickedness. He goes on to explain. You were perfect in your ways, from the day you were created, thus notice we're talking about a created being here 
who was originally perfect in his ways, till iniquity was found, another word for iniquity is transgression or sin, wickedness, evil, till iniquity was found in you. Now picture the scene with me. God and all of his holy angels, the heavenly intelligences, perhaps from other worlds, this, these cherubim, the seraphim, the angel hosts, all of the things that scripture describes being there in heaven are gathered around Christ, and he's scanning them with his all-knowing gaze. And everyone on the outside of the behavior and their inside character, pure and transparent as sunlight, until he goes around till his covering cherub. And he says, iniquity was found, and this is key, in you. Now, there are people here today, and I'm imagining there are things on the inside of you that you're not showing on the outside of you. It's quite possible. In fact, it's probable. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and guarantee it. There are things that are on the inside of you, thoughts, desires, impulses, emotions, whatever, you, that you don't necessarily show on the outside. Can you imagine a world where everyone showed their cards, if you will, all the time? It'd be weird. But from God's perspective, that's how he sees people. He not only sees the outside, but he also sees the inside. And apparently, as he's scanning the courts of heaven, he's going around, he discovers within this being, this covering cherub, iniquity, sin, right there in the courts of heaven. How is it possible? And by the way, the implication is no one else could see it. It was found in him. We're going to see this refrain repeated in Scripture when it talks about the original fall of Lucifer. It was not an outward show, at least at first. It began on the inside, in the heart, within him. He goes on to say, you were, after it says, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Verse 16 is here's how it manifested itself on the outside. By the abundance of your trading, and we're going to come back to that. What does that mean? What is he doing? Trading. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within. Again, the key is he was filled with violence, but that violence was in him. It was within. It was not on the outside. It was not overt, it was not uh, exposed, but it was violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, so notice this, because of what was going on in the inside of you, and the trading, whatever that means, manifestation on the outside of you, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones." This is another key. Notice the Lord didn't see his sin and immediately blot him out of existence. He simply cast him out of the courts of heaven. He didn't just remove his life. He removed his job. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. He was banished. He was sent away. He was cast out. But he wasn't destroyed. He wasn't blotted out. He was simply cast out. He was removed. He goes on to explain again, verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And here he tells us why he was cast out instead of being blotted out. And this will be key for the rest of our series. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Now, iniquity had already been found in him by God. But here he says, I have cast you to the ground. I have laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Verse 18 continues. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. So now it's not just one sin, it's multiples. It kept adding up and piling up the multitude of your iniquities. And here it says what the iniquity is again. By the iniquity of your trading. Some versions say traffic or merchandise. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you to ashes upon the earth. Notice he was cast from heaven to the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Friends, do you think it's possible that other angels knew this devil, this Satan, before he was the devil and Satan? 
that perhaps Gabriel and the other angelic hosts who remain loyal to God had a long relationship with this Lucifer being? And remember back to the parable, it is the angels, the servants of God, the reapers, who are asking the questions of God. How is this possible? And it's to them that God has to give an answer. I didn't do it. An enemy has done this. And there is a way in which you will be destroyed, but we can't do it yet. An enemy has done this. Goes on to say, verse 19, all who knew you. Again, he casts them out for the sake of those who knew him to start with. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. They can't believe it. It seems impossible. Yet now they see the evidence of what Christ had seen all along. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Now, this is an interesting thing. I want you to keep in mind the chronology here that we've seen. Apparently, there was perfection. He was a created being, this enemy of God, but iniquity was found in him. Therefore, he was cast out and he will be destroyed forever. You notice there's a progression. You used to be perfect. Now there's a sin problem and someday you will be destroyed. It's not instantaneous, friends. It's a process of destruction. Lightning from heaven is not its quickness. It's not its, its, its intensity. It's its visibility. He wants everyone to see it, that those who knew you might gaze at you. I turned you into ashes upon the, on the earth in the sight of all who knew you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. We see the same story in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, starting with verse 12, records this fall of Lucifer. Again with astonishment. You notice the, the tense of the writer, the prophet Isaiah says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And he says, here's why. For you have said, and this is key, in your heart. He wasn't saying these boastful things. Whatever we're about to read, he wasn't saying out loud per se, but it was dwelling, it was building, intensifying in his heart. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Notice again, the same similarities, a striking similarity, a parallel, a correspondence between Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 when it describes the fall of Christ's enemy. He used to be loyal. He used to be perfect, but something was going on on the inside of him. For you have said in your heart, iniquity was found in you. You were filled with violence within. All of it was inside. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on mount of the congregation. I will be like the Most High. What did Christ see in his right-hand man, in his covering cherub, that was the iniquity that would get him cast from heaven when it manifested itself in traffic, merchandise, trading? According to Isaiah chapter 14, it was desire for self-exaltation. Self, self, self. I'm going to plant a seed now that we're going to develop at the end of this series, but heaven does not operate on the principle of selfishness. It operates on the platform of selflessness. But here, Christ's representative, his ordained minister, his covering cherub, breaks that law of heaven, and he begins to speak dwell on self-ambition, self-exaltation, selfishness in his heart to the point that he became filled with violence within. Yet again it says, yet you shall be brought down 
There's the same chronology, the same sequence. Everything was good. You began to dwell on selfish, self-exaltation thoughts and become filled with violence, yet you shall be brought down. It's a process. And again, the same reason why is given. Look at verse 16. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you. Now, it's not like they will glance at you. They will just peek at you. They will have a look at you. No, no, no. It uses in a very intense form of watching. They will gaze at you and goes on to say they will consider you. Some synonyms for consider would be to think about, to mull it over, to ponder, to really wrestle with what does this mean? How did this happen? How should it end? Christ says those who see you, the ones who know you, those who have been around you, need an opportunity to look at you and think about this rebellion. Think about your iniquity. Think about what you've done. Those who knew you need a chance to see you as Christ has seen you all along. Again, back to Isaiah chapter 14. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? It's almost as if you used to have universal respect and adoration, and your influence was... But now, you've been reduced to ashes. You're nothing. Why did it happen? And friends, more importantly... How can we know it will never happen again? Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of its prisoners? How is it possible that someone so powerful, so influential, can become Nothing. Mm. This background helps us more clearly understand a passage that might be very familiar to some of us in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12 describes what's called a war in heaven. But I want you to understand the background of this war so that you can see better what that war must have been like. Because the idea of war in heaven seems very, very uh, uh, counterintuitive. It creates a little cognitive dissonance. How can there be imperfection in a perfect place? How can there be war around the Prince of Peace? How is it possible that heaven can be upended and have a war, a battle going on? Well, let's see what the scripture actually says. It says in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 12, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and his angels, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Notice again, this is the third time that Scripture has described this upheaval, this war, if you will, in heaven. And again, instead of being blotted out of existence, Satan is merely cast out of the presence of God, cast out of the courts of heaven, cast specifically to the earth. Why would he do it this way? Well, first of all, let's look at, fascinatingly enough, now I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have figured out that this Greek word that is used in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 for the war in heaven is the, is the word polemos, P-O-L-E-M-O-S, polemos. And it doesn't mean a violent, overt, bloody war with grenades and bombs and tanks and drones, if you will. It wasn't that kind of a war that we imagine typically now. Polemos is where we get the English word polemic. It's an argument. It's a counterstatement to some prevailing thought. For instance, Christ had a government. He had an idea. He had a system. He had a law that ruled heaven and all created intelligences. Yet the war in heaven was a war of ideas, a war of words. And Satan himself, this covering cherub who was perfect, 
begins to speak from his position of influence at the right hand of God, begins to position, position himself against the commands of God, against the government of God. He has a counter idea. And this is where I believe we see this concept of trading or traffic or merchandise. Now within him, there was self-exaltation. I want to be great. I want to be the best. I want to be the best. I want to be like the most high. I want to exalt my throne. I, 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 I. But on the outside, I'm guessing he looked very supportive of God and his kingdom so that when Christ was going around, no one else could see what was in his heart. But inside was stirring resentment, discontent, and eventually filled with violence. But that violence was within. That violence was within. It says here, thus he was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Often it is asked by very sincere questioning people, if there is a good God, how can there be a world like this? Where we have famine, disaster, crime, all kinds of war, disease, pestilence, problems of all kinds. I think of the great hymn, this is my father's world. But if you notice the words of that hymn always talks about the rocks and the trees and the skies and the seas, but it's no mention of the moral state of the world until the very end. It says, yes, 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 but there is a day coming when he's going to restore it. Spiritually, this is no longer our father's world. Though he created it, though he founded it, though he fashioned it with his own hands, spoke it into existence, and planted in that field, good, 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 good. We look around and we see nothing but tears, 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 tears. And it's not just the people who are hurt by this directly who are asking the question. According to the parable, even the angels in heaven have questions for God. Why is it like this? How could you possibly allow this? Do you want us to just end it now? And for some reason, Christ says, no, I won't do that. And I believe it goes back to what we learn in Ezekiel and in Isaiah, that he needs those who knew him. He needs his intelligent universe to see for themselves the things that he had seen in Lucifer all along. Let me give you this illustration. One night a man was home alone. Let's say his wife had gone out on a trip or something. He has the house to himself. Oh, and he's looking forward to a cozy evening at home. And he makes himself a hot drink and goes to a back room. And he doesn't have all the lights on in the house. He just has one lamp and a cozy chair in the back corner of the house. And he's going to read a nice thick book and get some good night's sleep. He's excited. And he starts reading his book, and there he's in the quiet of his home. And unbeknownst to him, on the outside of his house, someone looks at his place as a target. There's a burglar prowling around the neighborhood, and he sees a darkened house, at least from the front that he can see, and he figures, this is a prime target. I'm going in. He doesn't even put a mask on. He doesn't wear gloves. He doesn't, he's going to bust into this place, get all that he can, and spend his jolly time doing it, for he's going to be uninterrupted, for the people aren't home. So he thinks. So the man is in his chair having his nice read with his nice drink, and he hears not a, not a knock at the door, but kind of a scuffle at the door. And he hears some sort of rub, and all of a sudden he hears the door break. And he quickly, not wanting to be discovered, reaches for the phone, and at the same time turns off the light. And he can hear footsteps in his house. And they get louder and louder as he gets closer and closer. And the man realizes that the same place where he's sitting across in that very same room now is this uninvited guest. As he thinks of his options, he reaches up, clicks on the light. And for that one moment, there's the burglar Face fully exposed, expression f clearly seen, every facial feature known to the man who he didn't know was there. And then the man, with his face fully exposed, sees the burglar, and they see each other in the broad daylight, if you will, face to face, nothing between, and their facial expressions change. Both of them, 
eyes pop out, mouths drop open. And the burglar sees in his hand that he has a phone. And the man reaches down, calls 911 and says, there's a burglar in my home, get him. And the burglar says, I have to go. Fortunately, the police on the other end of the line say, no problem, we have a squad car right in your neighborhood. We'll come over there. And as he's running out the door, the squad car meets him at the same time, apprehends the suspect, takes him in the car, and heads off to jail. And the man of the house feels good. I have defended my home. <sighs> Going to go get some good sleep. So he goes and turns into bed. Has a great night's sleep. Now the burglar, on the other hand, did not have such a good night. He now has to go through the booking process, and he's gone through jail for evening. He didn't get good sleep on that nice metal cot. And he comes back in the morning, and not to freedom, but to bondage. And he's taken in, and he has to stand before the judge, and he has to have this whole process go forward. Now the other man wakes up, feels good about himself, has a good night's sleep, heads off to work. Now the criminal, the suspect, if you will, is taken into a courtroom, and there's the defense attorney, and there's the prosecutor, and there's the jury, and there's, if you will, all the people gazing and watching at this whole thing. And he walks in to face, you know, the judge. And of course they say, all rise. And he and everyone else in the room awaits the appearance of the judge. And of course, lo and behold, you might have guessed it already, out walks the judge, who was the very man whose house that man broke into the night before. And with the full light of day, no masks, no nothing, both men see each other face to face. And I can't help but think, the thought that runs through that burglar's mind is, I have the worst luck. What are the odds that the one home I would break into would be occupied and that the occupier would be the judge who would see me the next day? Face all hanging out and the judge says, oh, good to see you again. So nice of you to come into my house for the second time. So glad you could be here. Make yourself comfortable. Have a good... And you can imagine that he would stride perhaps to the, to the bench, have everyone be seated, and he said, and said, don't worry, Mr. Defense Attorney, Mr. Prosecutor, I've got your job done for you. I'm going to give you a heads up. You're going to win this case. Jury, you can go home. The whole court, bailiff dismissed the courtroom. I'm ready to render a verdict. And he gavels down his hammer. Guilty. Throw the book at him. Let me ask you a question. Is the judge correct in his assessment of the situation? Is this the burglar that broke into his home? Of course it is. It's identical. He's seen face to face. He was the witness. He's not only eyewitness, he's the victim, he's the judge, he's everything. He knows the end from the beginning in this particular matter. So though he's correct in his assessment, would he be just in his procedure? And the answer, of course, is no. Though the judge knows in minute detail, every aspect of this man's sin. Is it just for him to execute judgment without letting the rest of the courtroom see the evidence? Of course not. Now, you can imagine that everyone trusts the judge. They believe in him, but they say still it's Important for us to see the evidence. God knows, as we pull this analogy back to our storyline, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows what was in the heart of Lucifer. He has seen the outcome of his iniquity to the nth degree. He knows every step along the way. And he could have immediately said, you're out, you're done. But imagine what that would have been like from the reaper's perspective, from the angel's perspective from the friends of Lucifer who could not see into his heart, who did not know the end from the beginning, who couldn't see the violence within. If on that day when all the angelic hosts were arrayed before his, before his throne, Christ would step forward and take Lucifer and say, I'm sorry, friends, I know you don't see what I see, but just trust me, he has to die. And there in front of everyone, he executes his right-hand man, the covering cherub, his ordained minister.
You see, the question is often asked, if Christ knew what Satan would do, why didn't he just eliminate Satan? Let me tell you, the problem with sin is bigger than its originator. It's not just a person, it's a principle. And as Christ unfolds this principle, it's important not only for him to be right, it's just as important for him to be seen as right. For he's taken the great risk of creating intelligent, free moral agent creatures in his universe. And friends, it is important to God what you think. Your thoughts, your perceptions, your assessment of the situation is important to God. So important, in fact, that he's willing to take his time to get it right. He's willing even to sacrifice himself to demonstrate, as we, were go- we will see coming up, that Satan's arguments, his polemic against the government of God, his accusations, his questions, his insinuations are unfounded, and that what was in his heart needs opportunity to be seen by all. It matters to God what his creatures think. Which takes us back to the concept of lightning from heaven. I believe when Satan fell like lightning from heaven, as Jesus said, it was not just that it was instantaneous, it was the work of a moment, because friends, it's been thousands of years. What I believe he means is the same thing he meant for his own coming, that even as lightning shines from the east into the west and is visible for all to see, so needs to be the fall of Satan. His elimination from the universe needs to be seen by the rest of the universe in order to secure the safety of the universe forevermore. God has a plan. There is a day coming, but it is in the best interest of the redeemed and those who have never fallen at all for the good of the universe throughout eternity that God take his time, he gets it right, and no question will be left unanswered. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you are a God of deep thought, long-suffering patience, and Lord, you want to get it right. So Lord, we ask now that you help us to see through your word what you have seen all along. Help us to see the difference between your kingdom and the principles of Satan's kingdom, and help us to choose this day who we will serve. For Lord, we want to go to heaven, but we want a heaven that is safe for eternity. Lord, help our questions to be answered and help us to be part of the solution through Christ's strength alone, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.